Welcome. I really appreciate you all being here. I want to capture my work on film for posterity and to realize that um, if I can go through it, this is a stream I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be streaming. And what I'm going to be doing is basically, first I'll start out with saying, how did I get here? Um, I am a marriage family child therapist. And way back when, 43 years ago, uh, emotive therapy was in. And my form of therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, was seen as brief, you know, kind of superficial, not meaningful, not therapeutic. So that uh, basically I was uh, not recognized, not just me, but this system of cognitive behavioral therapy, which means pain is seen as an indicator of change needed or change in progress. It was not seen as a reason to do anything. Do you see? Feel your feelings since really pain and emotions are not really negotiable, negotiable with the mind. They are negotiable with drugs, medication. I want to say right now I'm going to put books in, books, books, books. I love the book by Gabor Mate, doctor, MD. And his book is When the Body Says No. And when the body says no, do something about it. So that particular book just came out recently, but it is where I come from. I am not really impressed with pain. Now, if I were a hedonist, I would be, but I'm a stoic. And the stoicism that I practice, if you're interested, is Marcus Aurelius, who was an emperor and a warrior way back in the golden age of Rome. And the book that I like, which is almost like poetic haiku, it's called the spiritual teachings of Marcus Aurelius. And in those statements, the idea is, if you're a Stoic, you do what's right to the best of your ability. Now, it may be a mistake, but you don't know it. So if you do what you think is right, I'm going to refer to God. It's not a religious system we're doing here, but I'm going to refer, or as Einstein said, I don't know whether there's a God or not, but whatever did it created a very complex universe. So he's saying the evidence is a creative force, and I choose to believe that. So with that in mind, uh, if you do everything that you believe is right, uh, anybody knows the book called the Bible? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's one of the good ones, Bhagavad Gita, the Koran, you know, there's lots of good books. Does everybody know the name Saul? Way back when, Saul went on a tirade to kill Christians because they were politically incorrect, I hate to mention it. Jesus was killed for political reasons, not religious reasons. So with that in mind, uh, Saul was on a horse going down to Damascus to kill the Christians, right? Then he had a spiritual awakening. Duh. What am I doing? I don't think I want to do that anymore. What did he do immediately? Changed his name. What was his name? Paul. He's Paul. So this is uh, Bill Wilson who helped, uh, you know, create a call along with Carl Jung, the 12-step program had a spiritual awakening, which is, duh, you see? 
So here's the rule of thumb in my world, philosophically. When you're a hedonist, you do what you believe is right, even if it's stupid. You don't know it's stupid. That's the reason that your personal choices of right and wrong, good and bad, good and evil, whatever, are your personal choices. If that's what you do, you are following God's will. Do what you think is right, whatever happens, that's it. And I love doing it that way because I know when I've done what I think is right, I just put it in the God box and say, whatever happens to it, eh, doesn't matter. I don't have to ruminate, ruminate. You know, it's interesting. I'm going to share like I'm sharing right now. Uh, I get my physical. How many people get physical every year? Physical. Blood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, 40-some years ago, I was a dead man walking. I was drinking daily. I weighed 205 pounds. My blood pressure was 250 over 148. Right? I was in bad shape. Okay? And I did something really bad. And so I was remanded to therapy. Okay? And because of that, I made a little prayer. I said, Dear God, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever you are, uh, if I could have a moment of sanity in my life, I want to help mankind for the rest of my life. That was 43 years ago. I'm not going to say my age, but you know I'm not young anymore. But I've never been healthier. And my doctor last year saw in my little notes that my HDLs were higher than my LDLs in cholesterol. He didn't say anything because he thought it was a fluke and a freak. Showed up this year. Not this year, last year. I'm going again and see if it shows up three years. And he said to me, this is weird. I've never seen this before. HDL is good. It's good. LDL, bad. Two years in a row, HDL higher than LDL. Why? Why is it that way with me? Do you know the reason? I don't fuss over anything. I don't fuss. I do what I got to do if I got a problem, and then I put it in the God box and away we go. So I used to be an artist and a musician. I was a junior high uh, art teacher. I taught grade school art. And I was a professional accompanist. That funny lady that sits behind the lousy soloist and makes them sound good. So I made a conversion to therapy. I was in the middle of a master's degree at Cal State Fullerton under Marilyn Bates and David Kiersey. Please understand me, Myers-Briggs test. I switched over to a master's in counseling, a 60-unit, lumpy, big master's, which was, now they call it a SIED. The next year, my PhD says PhD in counseling, but now it would be a SIED degree. So what I did was, I switched from a master's degree. Now what, I got to tell you, now this is way back in the 60s. And the message was uh, in counseling that I basically was going to do a paper on um, the effect of artificial illumination on kinesthetic objects. Can you imagine that? I was painting resin paintings on plexiglass boxes that rotated, beer signs actually. And I switched over and that was the beginning of what I did. 
What I did was I switched over to communication because Marilyn Bates, David Kiersey, please understand me, said basically that what you think and who you are impacts what you're doing. So I came across the following statement. Beware of your thoughts, for they become words. Be aware of your words because they become habits. Beware of your habits, they become your character. Beware of your character, it becomes your destiny at the bank, doctor's office, and in all your relationships. So I wrote a thesis called semantic realignment. Now what word is missing? Androgynous. I got the androgynous from Carl Jung because I did sober up and Carl Jung helped Bill Wilson create the 12-step programs. So that's when I added a word after I had gotten the degree. It's on, but I have the original paper that says androgynous, not, not androgynous, semantic realignment. So androgynous semantic realignment was a combination of Carl Jung, Pat Allen, Eric Byrne, because I got hooked up with Bob Duff's TA program where I started studying to become certified as a transactional analyst. Then I went off under, under Patrick Carnes, who was at Del Amo Hospital, and I studied under him in the area of sexuality. He was going to be the expert witness for Bill Clinton and Jennifer Flowers. So I ended up certified in sexual and alcohol addictions. So now I'm a combination of Carl Jung, Sigmund Freud is always there, I like him, but I like Carl Jung better. Eric Byrne, Bill Wilson, and that's when I got in touch with uh, energy, because that's all that's on the planet. So if you turn to page 15, we will look at energy. There's nothing in the universe but energy. And here's the message. The fastest energy is invisible. Therefore, what's the most, what is the most energized, invisible process? Thinking. Thinking. So when you can channel your thinking, you basically are living a rational life. Rational, not an emotional life. And that's the reason that my HDLs are higher than my LDLs, because I don't let my emotions interfere. I make mistakes, but I am committed to using my brain. Therefore, energy. Carl Jung was very hooked on the energy of the Chinese, yin-yang. Yang energy is very male. If you turn your page over, you'll see. We're going to go 15 to 15A. Now, men have yang bodies, but they have yin souls the anima. Women have yin bodies, but yang souls. How many people are in a not I'm not asking you if you're in a relationship. How many people are in a one-person body? Two, right? What do we do? How do we create a human being? What has to come together energy-wise? an egg and a sperm, right? It takes an egg and a sperm to make a people. Now, of the two, which one is moving? The sperm. Which one is not moving? It's just sitting there. The egg. What is the biggest cell in the human body? 
the egg. What's the smallest cell in the body? Sperm. Seems appropriate. See? So this is a yin and yang program. And the secret of life is to connect your yin to your yang. Now, yang energy in a man's body is built, let's turn over the page, it's built to compete. Anybody notice that? It's built to conquer. And it's built to control. How many women have heard at least you or another woman say, he's so controlling? Yeah, that's true. He's a man, at least for the first half of his life. Okay? Then they melt into more feminine. Look at the yin energy. Passive, it just sits there. Wonder who's going to impregnate me. Patient. How long is the egg fertile in a human body? About seven days. May not maintain the same quality, but you're impregnatable. So if you got laid last Sunday, be careful. You see? So, passive patient and vulnerable. How many women in the room have heard at least one women's liver say, you're as good as a man? Okay? Well, yes, that's true. But your form of goodness is in being stable, anchoring. Women anchor their femininity in their maleness, their yang. A woman's soul, the animus, is male. How does she control? No. Don't feel good. How many people know the words instinct and intuition? Who does better thinking intuitively about what they're doing, men or women? Men. When men do their instinctive, what do they do? They become feminine and self-centered. When women think their way through something, that's intuitive, right? Intuition is extrapolation of minute pieces of data about any subject. Women get what they want by knowing what they don't want. But how they say what they don't want is my business. As I started studying with Bob Duff's Orange County TA group, I started to realize that what you said made the difference. And I want to be very honest with you, my early audience were a bunch of people from the 12-step programs. I had to teach some things so quickly because the chances are they're going to run away and go get drunk. So I got in there and I, say it this way, which is very male, very competitive, conquering and controlling. So the audience that I had basically molded me into a conquering, controlling, competing woman in my business as a transactional analyst. So that's why everything I teach is like one sentence, Ugh. keep it simple, sweetheart. So the action, look at the action here of this Yang person, giving, protecting, and cherishing. Will all the men in the room raise their right hands? I promise, I promise. on my honor, my honor, to give, protect, and cherish 
Women, women kids, kids animals, animals, the planet, the planet even, when even when they're illogical, they're illogical irrational, irrational, and irritating. And irritating. So, help me God. so help me God. Now hear this, illogical, irrational, and irritating. So when a woman says, no, I don't want to do that, she's basing it on her instincts. Do you know what we know now? Do you know we have a brain in both the brain and the gut? Do you know that there are more neurotransmitters in your gut than there are in your brains? Pretty soon the psychiatrist will say to you, how's your gut feeling? Instead of, what do you think? See? So when women honor their instincts and go, no, they're basically anchoring their femininity in their instinctive feelings. But what does women's lip teach? You have a right to compete, you have a right to conquer, you have a right to control. Right? 20% of the young women are infertile today, you know why? They're too anxious. Their bodies are too anxious. Nature's not going to give babies to anxious women. See? So that's what happens. And what happens when a man anchors his masculine in his feminine? He wants to receive. He wants to be available to receive. Why didn't you call me? And he wants to be respecting of the person who gives, protects, and cherishes him. What do we call him? We call him Peter Pan. A wuss. But who does he go with? He goes with a woman who's a man. You see? So, what is Yang energy interested in? It's interested in maleness, which is competitive, conquering, and controlling. It's into mental wellness. What's mental wellness? Intuition or instinct? What is mental wellness? Intuition. Intuition. Mental. And what's he interested in? Money and sex. The book for women I like is Sex, Time, and Power by Leonard Schlein. It talks about the power of women's veto right, the ability to say no to immoral, unethical, and illegal things. Do you see? when saying yes would cause you damage. So females are in charge of femaleness, which is physical wellness. Do you know that men do better in a relationship than we do? We can gang up with our girlfriends. But a man without a mother or a sister or a caretaker or a wife or a girlfriend or a daughter, don't live as long. Do you know the reason? Their maleness has them running up and down the streets chasing money and sex. There's three motivators for human behavior. Money, sex, and mind-altering chemicals. And mind-altering chemicals are either bought on the street, you can either buy dopamine, or you can make it in your body. And if you make it in your body, it's usually because you're chasing money and sex. That's an upper. Sex is one of the biggest dopamine creators. See? So, this is all that we are doing is channeling energy. And what I do is I channel it through rational or uh, emotional behavior. If you will, give a turn to page five. Do you ever notice that this, if, if somebody stole my manual and wanted to teach what's in it, they couldn't do it, could they? Because it's too simple. You have to know what's going on behind it. 
So here is a basic premise which is based in hedonism, stoicism. Hedonistic people are very much into this world. This is their heaven. For a stoic person, this is our testing ground. This is where we learn how to be good human beings. So let's take a look at emotional people. Now, I'm going to say something pretty regularly today. Emotional people do not care about feelings. Sounds like they should, but they don't. What do they care about? They care about winning, competing, conquering, and controlling. So look what they do. If they have anything painful or pleasurable, I don't even want to think about being the guy that just won the half a billion dollars. But he will sort out his friends and his enemies. And if he's a stoic, he will see that other people benefit by his winning. He will be good to himself, but he will not be. If he's a hedonist, he will die soon. So here we go. Emotional people. Gah! Bing! React. Look what they do. They react and they play games. What are games? Games are what you do when what you say is not what you mean. And people do not know that they're playing games. They think they're telling the truth. And you know the reason? Because the people that taught them how to play games, parents, cultures, churches, schools, said this is the way human beings do it. So watch this. Emotional, react. Now what does the word react mean? It means you're doing something you've been taught to do over and over and over and over and over again. You're reacting. I feel my emotions and my feelings in my body. I react, whatever that is, hit you, drink, run away. And then I think about it. And then I get mad at me or you. Critical shoulds. I should have done it better. I should have known it better. You should have done it better. You should have known it better. On the back of my card, it says, don't should on me. Do you see? Stoic people basically only deal with what they want and what they don't want. And they always check the price tag for it. What's it going to cost me to do this? And if they don't know, they go to a doctor and find out, what's it going to cost me to have unprotected sex with that guy that says he's had a vasectomy? Do you have proof that he's got a vasectomy? Get the proof. No, it's only a pimple, right? That's a good one. So, feel, react, think later. Now look at what rational people do. They have the same pain and the same pleasure. They have a moment of emotional reaction, and then they go, what is it I want that I don't have? What is it I have I don't want? And they act on it, act. Difference between react and act is acting means you are an individual and you are actualizing your identity. See? The first year of life is yang. Little babies can hang on to hair and drag their body around. That's a survival technique. But by six weeks, their abdomen is too big and they can't do that. They have to start attracting care. The second year of life, what is the second year of life? No. It's yin, yang, first year, no, second year. Third year, you get to decide if you're going to play games or you're going to negotiate. And that's what androgynous semantic realignment is all about. 
So this is the difference between rational and emotional. Okay? What do human beings need? This is on page one. The difference between a need and a want is you go crazy or die if you don't get your needs met. But your wants basically are optional. You won't, you maybe not die or go crazy. Your life simply will be frustrated. Let's look at this. Physically, what do we need? Food, water, air, and shelter. Got it? What do we need emotionally or feeling wise? We need strokes. Now, what are strokes? Strokes are anything that relates to your body. Way back during the Depression, Dr. Spitz did an investigation of foundlings, babies left on doorsteps. And this is what he found. You could feed a baby, house a baby, but if you didn't touch them, they didn't flourish. They died. So then, a Dr. Penfield, a little bit later, did a research project on the bare brain. Skull gone. The brain is pain free. And Dr. Penfield was the beginning Dr. Amons, who's a psychiatrist functioning today, who investigates how the brain operates. Dr. Norman Doidge has a book, and it's called The Brain That Changes Itself. We now know that the brain is neuroplastic. Beware of your thoughts, for they become words. Beware of your words, they become habits. Beware of your habits, they become your character. Beware of your character, it becomes your destiny. What we do in androgynous semantic realignment is modify your brains so that you're not copying the people that got you into my office or into this class. Because whoever they were are still talking for you. And I'm going to give you a very quick, fake it till you make it, act as if till the feelings follow way to modify your brain, the Broca aspect in your left hemisphere. The Broca is named after Philip Paul Broca, second, last century, psychiatrist. Guy blew a rod through his head. Didn't kill him, but he couldn't use words from that time on. So they honored him by saying, that's the Broca. And today, our doctors in medical school study the Broca. It's called the muscle of speech. Now, it takes eight weeks to ruminate your way into or out of a decision, because our brain does it that way. Some people drink, eat, do drugs, then it doesn't work. Then you just go around and around and around and around. But if you're sober, and when I say sober, that does not mean that you're necessarily drug free. You don't have to be drug free off insulin to be a good human being when you're a diabetic. There is nothing wrong with taking medicine to facilitate your brain working. Antidepressants, beta blockers, do you see? Alternative medicine, east-west combos. The dangerous ones are pain seducers. I'm not going to name them. Pain seducers stop the process. For example, when you do, when you binge on sleeping pills, you don't dream, do you? No. And if you don't dream, what happens to all the garbage you go through? It all backs up. I'm going to draw you a little picture. Here you are, you're six months in utero. At six months, you basically 
can know what you don't like and do like. You can't use words. You're a fetus. We now know that fetuses basically know what they feel pain about or pleasure about. And from this point on, as Penfield found out, you record, boom, till the last day of your life. Dr. Penfield went in and touched spots on the nervous system. Guess what came up? Whatever was recorded there. Everything that you've absorbed. Now, the, when you do sleeping pills inappropriately, you don't do this. So what happens to all this energy? Backs up. You get mentally constipated. That's what happens. What's this called? It's called a PTSD. We have a lot of people, soldiers now, that are suffering from that. Post-traumatic stress disorder. These can be etch-a-sketched. You know, at night when you do your REM sleep cycle, your eyes go back and forth? What do you think they're doing that for? So you can etch-a-sketch your nervous system. And when you do that, you probably still can't get rid of that one. Where do you go with that one? You go to a therapist who does EMDR. That takes advantage of that Etch-a-Sketch. But you have somebody helping you because what it takes is connecting your left lobe with your right lobe so that you aren't disassociated. See, when people are traumatized, what happens is there's gaps between the connection of their thinking brain and their feeling brain, the right lobe and the left lobe. And we're going to learn this in this period of time, especially with regard to getting into an intimate relationship. We know that you got into a relationship with your mom and dad, but when you have a trauma, nature sets up a gap. This is called disassociation. And the problem here is, when you're under three years old, you can't use words. You don't really get, I do therapy on three years old. Three-year-old kids have enough consciousness and verbal control that you can negotiate with them, okay? But under three, you have to have tapping, or you have to have somebody touch your brain and see what happens in there, like a pen field. See? So the point is, getting your stroke needs met uh, is either pain strokes or pleasure strokes. If you've been raised on pain strokes, you will not like pleasure. You will produce norepinephrine to stop the pleasure. How many people in the room have ever sabotaged something really nice? When I was sobering up and I was starting to date, I had to build in one to two hours of getting lost time. Like I'm going to meet somebody, I had to build it in because if I didn't, I was so acclimated to pain that I didn't want to think about pleasure. Pleasure was scary. See, the interesting thing about human beings is if you're used to being a pain addict, see there's pain addicts, okay? And that pain addict, if you're addicted to the norepinephrine of pain, which is a depressant, your subconscious will take care of you to keep you alive by causing you to do this and to sabotage. Why did I do that? I used to remember when I was driving to wherever Denny's or someplace I was going to meet him, I would go, yeah, I know he said go straight. I'm going to go left. Where'd that come from? It came from my instinct. Avoid pleasure, because it's going to be taken away. Do you see? So with that in mind, we need strokes, pain or pleasure. 
I'm not going to ask if anybody's a pain addict here. Now, strokes come from people sometimes. I'm not going to ask you that either. If a girl has a father who is not giving, protecting, and cherishing, she has to become a man. If a boy who has a mother that can't stand him in pain, he's got to be a woman. Got to be. So that feminine man has got to go with masculine woman. Even if she thinks she doesn't like it. But she's got to go with him because she doesn't feel normal with a good man. What do women say about good men? Boring. Do you know the reason? Because a good man doesn't produce a dopamine high. Doesn't produce a dopamine high. The dopamine high comes from the pain. Which has more energy, pain or pleasure? Pain. No pain, no gain. Do you see what I'm saying? So for a woman who's built to be instinctive, if she's been raised poorly, she is going to instinctively avoid boring men that are pleasurable. And there's an old saying out there, men love crazy women. Do you know the reason? Crazy women are illogical, irrational, and they're irritating, but they can't compete, conquer, and control. They're so broken. They need their women broken. So they'll pass right by a good woman, right by her. Okay? Okay. So we have, and we've got to do another thing. Um, there's people, animals. How many people had an animal that loved you better than your sisters, brothers, mothers, and dads? Right? We haven't lived, if you're a therapist, until you find a guy who lives raised on a farm and he had a favorite duck. And guess what they did to his duck? They killed it and said, hey, we're eating Harry. Ay, ay, ay. The book on that is M. Scott Peck's book, People of the Lie. Scariest book on the planet. Makes Stephen King look like a lullaby writer. M. Scott Peck. And then things. What are the things? Money, sex, and mind-altering chemicals. We're right back there again. Now, in order to heal, you got to have brains. I've never given this lecture to uh, retarded, never. I've given it to caregivers, nurses, whatever. And you need an education about how to get your stroke needs met and how to structure time. Okay? All right. So, with that in mind, now I want to... And I want to show you something about relationships, because that's what you're here for. If you will, turn to page 18. What have we learned so far? We've learned about three motivators for human behavior. We've learned about rational and emotional. How many people want a relationship? You're, you want, you may want to mate and you want to marry. How many people want to mate? You don't need a legal document. You don't need legitimate kids. You don't need to be in his obituary. Because you can't get there if you're not legally married. See? It's the ex-wife. How many people want a relationship? Okay, mating or marriage? Do we have a, you know, mating is a marriage in which you are monogamous, 
continuous, and long-term. Now, the interesting thing about monogamous is if you and he decide to swing or you and she decide to swing, that's your version of monogamy. I've got women picking women for their husbands rather than having them go out there and get their own. So you got to stretch your mind to the idea of whatever works for you works for you. Okay? Monogamy, whatever you design. Continuity. If you live on two ends, I've had a couple, they were flight attendants. They got married. But he was grounded in New York, she was grounded in Los Angeles, and they got married. And they went back and forth. Because, you know, free flight. The parents went berserk. That's not marriage. Yes, it is. I'm going to teach you how to negotiate, negotiate that. And later I will give you the tools of communication. Right now I'm building a philosophical system grounded in nature, therapy, and what I've learned. So monogamy, continuity, and longevity. How long do we want this to go? I am a New Thought minister. I do weddings, don't do funerals. And when it comes down to the end, I say to love one another till love ends. Not death. Staying alive in a bad deal, which will kill you earlier anyway, is not the goal. It's work on being love. So all the people that want a mating or a legal marriage, get your hands up. I promise, on my honor, never will I commit to a finite, fallible human being. Instead, I will commit to the relationship. I will do my half, and I hope to God they do theirs. What word do I hate, load, can't abide? What word? Trust. Trust. How weird is that? I don't deal with pain. Pain only indicates change is needed and change is in progress. That's all it means to me. And if you trust, every baby that's born trusts that the people that had that baby are going to take care of it. Is that a true fact? No. And have you ever seen in your newspaper, and her boyfriend killed her two-year-old son, beat him to death? Anybody read one of those articles? You've never heard it say, and her boyfriend killed her two-year-old daughter. Why is that? What's the first thing a lion does when he meets a lioness? First thing, kills the cubs, kills the competition. That nutty guy that killed the little boy saw that kid as a walking sperm cell evidence that she had had sex with somebody. Do you understand that? We're talking about get down nature. Nature is not kind. So when I have a couple, if they have chemistry, I will work like a dog to keep them together. Do you know the reason? Unless they get the lesson of what's wrong with their relationship, they're just going to keep reproducing it and reproducing it and reproducing it. What is the end of a relationship? Apathy and empathy. You're not even mad. You are bored stupid. Isn't that interesting? That's what's unique about what I do, is I'm a nerd, I'm a scientist, and I'm basically like hunting 
for reality and putting it into words. But the words I say are things like, don't trust humans. We're the only animal that could commit a crime and a sin. Take a risk on us. The back page in your syllabus, it's on page 24. What is love? The only way you know you love yourself or anybody else is the contracts, commitments you're willing to make and keep. Flowers are nice, sex is nice. Sorry about that. Contracts are the best. You see? So when you have chemistry for somebody, now you can have chemistry for the person sitting next to you in church, and for about three days your body's going to go, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Because nature is built to put people of chemistry together to make babies for nature. What's the addictive chemistry that glues people together. What's it called? Oxytocin. Oxytocin is a neuropeptide that goes along with the estrogen. Who's on estrogen? Premenopausal women, postandropause men. I'm going to be doing this lecture for the over 50 relationship and I'll be talking about them. Just buy it right now. Young women and older men glue. Do you see? Young men and older women, cougars, screw around. Don't glue. Don't want to mention names, but Madonna, J-Lo, Tina Turner. We have a man that does our opening at the show in Los Angeles. He has a funny joke. He recites this, everyone's pretty regularly. And he says, ladies, just think, your boyfriend is not born yet. <laughs> you see? So with that in mind, I want you to see that get your stroke needs met and how to structure your time. How to structure your time. Okay, so now I want you, if you will, turn to page 18. Now, when you meet somebody, what's the first thing that happens? Chemistry. But for men, that's pretty much where it is. His penis tells him who he likes right now. Okay? For women, if a woman is a pain addict, Good guys will bore her, and bad guys will excite her. So what I do is I require that if you want me to help you get into a mating or a marriage, Getting to I Do, which is my book, still in the stores. Staying married and loving it, not in the stores. People want to get married, they don't want to stay married because they don't know my stuff. But I want them to learn my stuff. So here's this. This is my idea of how to start getting to I do. Chemistry. Now the interesting thing is, what did I say about men? When a man is a man, male body, there are some women that are men. See, when a woman has to take care of herself as a little girl, 
when she's a women's lib addict, she is going to be very competitive, conquering and controlling. And I want to make a statement. Everything I'm teaching is based on the quantum physics of the Chinese version of yin and yang. This is thousands of years old. This is how they thought about ACDC, positive and negative, action and passive, okay? So what I want you to realize is the ego is designed to take care of the body, not the soul. When the ego takes care of the soul, that person is either a saint, or if it's a man, it's a wuss, and if it's a woman, it's a bull dyke. Do you see that? What's the ego made up of? The mind and the will. The mind and the will. Dan Siegel is really into mind stuff. Mind sight. He's coming out with a good new book. It's about teenagers. You know what it's called? Brainstorm. Do you know that teenagers' brains drop down in the chronic level of dopamine so that they require peaks of dopamine? That's why they act cuckoo. And their job is to get away from home, go. So that they really, their brain is not finished till they're like 25 to 27. So those teenage pregnancies and those teenage marriages, they're not finished baking. So when a woman is ego dystonic, the ego serves her animus, which is Latin for male love. When it serves her animus, I require that she dates that person three times if he comes after her. What am I doing? I'm desensitizing her to a new style of man. Oh, but I know he's not going to work on that one. I want you to date him three times unless he's got an orange uniform with numbers on the back. Got it? Because what she's doing is desensitizing. And then if all goes well and there's some natural chemistry, I have her uh, keep on doing it after the third date. But, see I believe this, the first time you do something, you're experiencing it and investigating it. Then you're trying to adjust to it. There's the awe level, the assimilation level, then the actualization level, which is the third date. Now, if there's no chemistry, ladies, then I require that you say to this gentleman, Thank you so much for the three dates we've had and asking me again, but I must tell you the following. I do not have romantic chemical feelings for you, and I don't want to use you, and I don't want to lead you on. Do you see what that is? Is that hedonism or stoicism? That's stoicism. What would a hedonist do? Use him. Use him. She'd let him entertain her, she'd let him spoil her, she'd let him, and then she'd walk away. Hedonism, okay? Don't forget, Marcus Aurelius, the spiritual teachings of by Forstater, edited by Forstater. Good book. Okay, so I ask that there be the possibility of a courtship. See, courtships are coming under the bomb of hooking up. What's a hookup? Your place, my place. It's two people that want to have sex without accountability. Is that hedonism or stoicism? It's hedonism again. 
It's two people that know that they want sex. Recently, I belong to the American Psychological Association. They did a research project on hooking up and whether men or women like it or didn't like it. Both liked it for about 60 to 90 days. Remember, rumination? Who did not like it? Women. Women. Now I'm going to show you the difference between these three systems. Courtship is one person, Yang, the masculine. Can that be a butch feminine, a butch a lesbian? Yes. I don't, there are more men with vaginas today than ever before. There are more women with penises today than ever before. Is that a correct statement? So here we've got Yang. Look what Yang gives. Concretely, flowers, dinner, concretely. Look what feminine yin, could be a man, could be a woman. Look what that person does, receives concretely. Thank you, yes please. All the women in the room, just say for the practice of it, yes please, thank you. Yes please, thank you. Good, at least you know how to say it. <laughs> Look how she gives back. She gives back abstractly. If they're hooking up, they both give sex. But within three months, she feels used and abused. He goes, what do you mean? We both used each other. That's what we did. So Yang gives concretely. Yin receives concretely, thank you, and gives back abstractly. That's thank you. Now that's courtship. In a relationship, here's how a relationship is built. What's this? What's happening right there? Chemistry. For men, his eyes see what he wants. For women, her ears hear what she wants. He wants sex. What does she want? Money. Well, that's just prostitution. I hate to mention it. The only thing different between a wife and a prostitute, other than blessings and goodness, is the prostitute doesn't have to do laundry. It's a cheaper deal. Go, oh. To raise marriage to a spiritual event, there has to be a negotiation, which we're going to learn, right? Okay, so this is the moment of chemistry, right? So you'll have how much time? Zero to three months. Everything is perfect. People shave, they put makeup on, they act nice, right? Uh. Then we go three to six months. Imperfect. He does something irritates you. She does something irritates you. Third three months, six to nine months, you now negotiate. Later on today, I'm going to give you the tools for negotiation. And then you commit to the relationship because they are 51% valuable. And on some days, you better remember why you're there. When I was married to my husband, last one, I did it a few times, but I'm getting it right now. So on the days I didn't like him, I stayed for two desks and two oriental rugs. 
because I like my paintings to live with those desks and rugs. Now, when I got off it, then I would be in love with them again. But that's what, why am I here? Two desks, two rugs. Good enough for that day. You see? Is that hedonistic or stoic? That's hedonistic. I was staying for the hedonistic value because I didn't like him. So I had an excuse. It's a temporary attack of gold digging. <laughs> okay. So we're going to learn how to negotiate here, but right now I want you to see what the difference between courtship is, right? Now, once you get to the point, and this usually happens, the first move towards commitment is, I want you off Match.com. I want you off. I'm off. I want you off. And hopefully it's the Yang person that says so. Get off. Do you see what I mean? At that time, the yin person says, oh, we, we got to look. How do yang and yin people fall in love? Commonly referred to as men and women. Okay? Take a look at the plus. That plus is female. Now, when you look at that, where is this female yin person grounded? Are they grounded in the concrete world of, of uh, concrete material things? Or are, they, or are they grounded in the abstract unconscious? Feelings process femaleness. Yin people are in love with themselves. You see? Yang people are in love with getting what they want. You notice the dotted line? Only Yang people fall in love. Yin people are already in love. How do Yin people get into commitments? By knowing what they don't want by saying no. Women get yin people, men or women, because men can be yin too. Yin people get what they want by knowing what they don't want. Yang people say, you want to? What is he saying, you want to? Hook up. You want to hook up? Do you want to have sex? That period, two, two weeks. Two weeks. If he calls back, what's he going to ask? You want to? If she says no, what's he going to do? He's either going to dump her, go off to some other ladies that say yes. But the problem is, why did she say no? What is she, from the 50s? Because that's what people say about my work. If it's from the 50s, the great generation, it's because it's based on science. The book Sex, Time, and Power by Leonard Schlein. When women say no to immoral, unethical, and illegal behavior, they get cared for. They get what they want. So it takes approximately eight weeks for a man to decide that he wants this person badly enough to keep competing, conquering, and controlling her male, getting her to surrender. You see this? So when you get to that negotiable time, see that right here? Normally it takes approximately six months to really feel anchored in a relationship. And at that time, you negotiate and consummate. Isn't that word consummate interesting? 
Can you consummate a relationship with a hand job? No. If you don't consummate a marriage with intercourse, can you get an annulment? Yes. See what I'm saying? So at this time, they set up, she, look at, look at the characteristics of the in-person. The characteristics are abstract. Remember I said abstract? Now, do you recall the pledge? I promise to give, protect, and cherish women, kids, animals, and the planet, even when they're illogical, irrational, and irritating. That's abstract. Why don't you? I don't know, it just doesn't feel good. What's that got to do with reality? It just doesn't feel good. That's a woman listening to her instincts. Okay, so she's abstract. She's a processor. That's feelings. She's a feeler. She wants to be cherished. She's a follower. She responds. She's protected. She's provided. She's passive. She's self-love. See those characteristics? That's yin. Let's look at yang. Concrete. What's the difference between you and I having sex? We're both humans. We need it. Performer. Thinker. Respected. Leader. Asserter. Protector. Provider. Active. Other lover. Now, that usually occurs right here when you negotiate a deal. And within three months, when I, when I have couples come in my office, I ask them to negotiate a deal, which we're going to show you, negotiate a deal that they will then live with for two months. Why two months? Because it's eight weeks, and that's the rumination period of time to neurobiologically impact the brain. If you can do anything for two months, the first, the first three days of doing something different is the beginning. I call, that's the awe time, the awareness time. Oh my God, I didn't know that. I love it when I'm dealing with masculine women and they can't use any think words. <sighs> they can barely talk. How do you feel? I feel that this is really hard. No, how do you feel? <sighs> it takes three days to start the dendritic development of the brain. Okay? This development is, what are these called? Dendrites. Dendrites. They're the little cilia on the end of every one of a billion neurons. What's this? That's the synaptic gap. And what jumps over this synaptic gap? Dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Your neurotransmitters. They're like the water that the electricity flows through. See, your nerves are not directly connected. They are connected through the electricity of the neurotransmitters. What is the one thing necessary to rewire the brain? What is the one process necessary? Anxiety. It has to be scary. If it's not scary, it doesn't produce the electricity. No pain, no gain. When people talk to you or you see people doing crossword puzzles and these things for brain health, no. What's the best way to keep the brain stimulated and alive? Language. Language. Languages. The anxiety of learning languages is automatically energized, you see? So 
these, it takes three days to start this dendritic development. It takes 30 days to soft wire. This is why rehab is 30 days. It takes 60 days to hardwire. This is boot camp. Boot camp. If you do anything for 60 days, it will take you three days to unwire it. How many people have ever stopped going to the gym? You're unwiring. And therefore, you're setting up a new dendritic system. So, with this in mind, you are now ready to negotiate. And what are you going to negotiate? Here's what we're going to negotiate. And is there any couple in the room that would be willing to negotiate in front of all of us on camera? Oh, thank you. Okay. Relationship contract items. Now this relationship contract items can be for work, it can be for relation, it can be for parenting, but let's go over the items. Individually, not together, what is the reason you cannot negotiate together? Because the yang person will dominate the yin person. We have to give the yin person the space to put down their scary not wants. See? The yin person is a spiritual guide in a relationship. That's the person that says no. You know, Aristophanes wrote a play and he called it Lysistrata. And that play called the women of Troy. The women of Troy were getting mad about the war. Their kids were getting killed and their husbands or whatever. And they said, what are we going to do to stop this stupid war? How many men in the room know what they did? There will be no more food. There will be no more sex. There will be no pillows for your cement benches unless you stop doing this. I maintain that if all the women on the planet were to join the women of Troy, right? I'd be really glad to head it up. Uh, if all the women on the planet were to join an agreement and say, I will say no to all the men in my life that are doing something that I instinctively know is immoral, unethical, or illegal. How long would it take us to clean up the planet? Two months. Two months. In the play Lysistrata, that's what happened. Remember, Men are the bricks of the universe. You can build things with bricks, but they're fairly boring. That's why in the Garden of Eden, Jesus, you know, Adam said, hey God, this is boring. We're just fighting and can't you do something fun? He said, sure, I'll take a rib out and I'll make a woman. That'll be fun, <laughs> right? And that's, that's metaphorical. Whether you believe it or not, it's metaphorical. You see, my book that's going to come out is It's a Man's World. You guys are in charge of junk. Buy it, sell it, steal it. We women are in charge of air. Air. If we all decided we'd cut down your air, if you didn't clean up your act, how long would it take us? Not long. Okay? So with that in mind, here are the relationship items that need to be negotiated by a couple when they've come to the point 
of be making love. Now, what are the three items that have to be negotiated before you have intercourse? Not hugging, not kissing, not getting naked, whatever. What do you need for a contract to do that? Affection. Longevity. Continuity. How often am I going to see you? Longevity, continuity, and exclusivity. Even if you've got 15 people in your sex circle, that's not my business, that's your business, what you negotiate. And if you agree to see each other, I see my boyfriend one weekend a month, talk to him every day, see him one weekend a month. He's working, I'm working, we don't have time for a relationship daily. See? So whatever takes, whatever's okay with you is okay with him, it's fine. So longevity, mate or marry, continuity, how often do we see each other, and exclusivity, how do we handle them? You see? So individually, you each write down what you want, who does what? Yin or yang? Yang. Whether you're the yang woman or you're the yang man, want writes down what they want and then what they don't want. Because we're all both. Every man is also a woman, every woman is also a man. There's four people in every relationship. So, Time. How much time do you need to be apart? I need to go hunting. I had one couple I was in. Hunting. Or I gotta go see my mom. Okay. So it's I time of a day of a week of a month of a year. We, that's two people. And they're not going to the movies. When you go to the movies, you're not on we time, you're on us time. You, 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 me, and them. That's us time. Going to a sports event, that's you, you, and them. It's gotta be you, you, eating a meal, walking, sitting on a beach by the whatever. It's two people doing something physically pleasant with nobody invited. And if you're with a medical doctor, he's gotta say, I'm on call, so is it okay that I leave my phone on? But gotta get permission. And couple plus others is you two going to a ski club or a poker game or wherever you're going. So time is how much time do you want to do this or that? Space. Do you like where you're living? Remember I told you the couple that he was there and he was there and the folks were furious about it? And I said, you're fine. If it's okay with you, it's their problem. I, don't, I have couples get mad because they don't sleep together. Somebody with apnea and somebody with restless legs can't sleep together. They can have two suites, come to bed, play, watch movies, whatever, and then separate and go to their own room. You can't live long without sleep. So you've got to get out of the box, see? You got to create something that nobody else does, but you're okay with it. Private property is prenups and postnups. Prenups and postnups. There's nothing wrong with these, especially with people that have been divorced and lost money. It can make the marriage work better. Private space is closets, drawers, dens, sewing rooms. I had a couple got a real neat little cottage on the beach, but it had one extra bedroom, right? He was a lawyer and he wanted a den. She was a seamstress and she wanted a sewing room. You know what we had to do? Murphy, Murphy, you know Murphy beds, they come out of the wall? Murphy 
wall. They made desks, sewing room. They shared it, but they modified it so that they both, when they had that room, they both were comfortable. Private space. Maintenance prop responsibilities, that's, that's um, usually plumbing, heating, koi ponds, pools. And that doesn't mean that you have to be a man to do that because there are women that are bricklayers and there are guys that are crocheting. Chores are who sees to it that the food's in the house, cooked, laundry, whatever. So what is your ideal in a relationship? Money, my money, your money, our money. How's it gonna go in? Who's the controller? How's it going out? Play, non-sexual play. Under non-sexual, I. I don't want you to be on the phone when I get home every day. I don't want you to be eating too much. I don't want you using drugs. I don't want you drinking. So I, under non-sexual, is not, I wanna play golf and then I wanna bowl. It's, I don't want you to do the following. We, I want us to go on a ski trip once a year, something. It's non-sexual play. Us, I want us to belong to a dance club. Under sexual, I don't want you having sex with other people. What do you want? Now, interesting about the sex issue. Okay, uh, men or women too. So it very means, first of all, if you're not making love once a week, got it? Being sexual once a week, you better be sick unto death or out of town. Because the bodies need to be fed. They need to be touched. Ashley Montague, third edition. Talking and touching are the two forms of communication. And talking is only 10%. 90% is touching. You see? And guess what happens? If you don't keep your dendritic development up by being touching, what happens to those dendrites? Goodbye, sex. Goodbye, sex. Okay? Us is for people that want to swing. I'm not a moralist, I'm a therapist. You want to swing? We'll negotiate the boundaries for swinging. See? Okay. Now I'm going to show you about uh, the types of relationships. Okay, here's a piece of information. One of the things that you've got to negotiate before you marry somebody, because it's a big deal, is what style of family did they come from? What style? There's two styles. One style is nuclear. This is very European. Japanese love this one too. What style do they come from? Because if you come from one and they're from another one, you got a natural problem. Remember I said chemistry? Then you've got to have compatibility. And compatibility is all of this stuff. And most of all, you need communication. And that's androgynous semantic realignment, which we will be doing the tools. So I can't do anything about chemistry. It's either there or it isn't. Compatibility, we can do something about it. But here's the original 
issue that you've got to find out. Does your person come from a nuclear family where there is a mom or a dad or a grandpa or a grandma that basically is the king or the queen? And everybody, that you, everybody, and including the enemies, the whole family is a unit, and here's the pro of that f group. Maintain status quo. Persians love this. Okay? Japanese love this. Italians love this. This is, Spanish loves this. By the way, did you know that Latin and Hebrew both languages are androgynous. They take into account the feminine and masculine. Isn't that absolutely wonderful? Pro, maintain status quo, money and property. The family's first. Then there's the cellular family. This is the American way. In the cellular family, each cell is autonomous, and they get together for birthdays, Christmas. They're having a big time right now. <laughs> These guys just doing more of the same. The pro is that it supports individuality. Family is second. The con is status quo is not maintained. Family second. The con for a nuclear family, individuality is suppressed. You don't fit. Money, property first, family first. Do you see that? That is a style of relationship. Okay? So, what did I ask for? The styles, there they are. Now we're going to do the three types of relationships and we're going to have a wonderful couple come up and they're going to negotiate these items, those items, time, space, money and play. In a convenient relationship, both people are working and bringing in money. It may not be the same amount like two doctors or two lawyers, but they're both going out to work and doing that. Two independent people bring social financial security. Harvard did a study in the 90s. Yang people mate and marry for sensual and sexual stability. Good homes, clean food where they can rest and go out and make money and a sensual sexual person who makes it fun and a sexual sensual for a joint venture in the world. That's a convenient relationship. Their biggest problem is communication. I think, I think, I want, I want, I feel, I feel, I don't want, I don't want. You come, it, relationships come in three styles like dances, discoing, slam dancing and waltzing. I teach waltzing. I teach waltzing. In a codependent, two dependent people, both question marks, symbiotically come together, we, to face, face a fearful world. In this one, one person is a 10, the other person is a zero. Codependent. There are cultures that love this. And I don't mind, you like it, I'll help you do it. Then there is a third style of relationship called a covenant. Two independent people, they don't need to be married, they don't need, they can make their own money and they cook their own meals. Two independent people, I, I, you saw, notice up in convenient it's I, I. You gotta be an I to be a we to be an us. Negotiate. Negotiate a mutual interdependency, not a codependency, an interdependency, we, for a greater good. Look at the way I spelled good. God. Why? Because one person is designated the breadwinner and they sacrifice a lot of hedonistic pleasure. 
be equal? Because it's competitive. I think, I think, I want, I want, I feel it. I love it. I'm really teaching myself and you out of business. I should shut up. Do you see? Women's Lib is making me a lot of money. So that's the point. You can be equal. The only problem is you'll end up business partners with no sex. And each of you will have to go out and get a lover. Other than that, it's fine. It's okay with you, it's okay with me. It's called a bifurcated divorce. You know what that is? We stay in business together, but we get divorced legally. Or we stay married and separate all the property. That's called a bifurcated divorce. Okay, in Louisiana, Arizona, Minnesota, and Michigan, you can have a covenant. But people like me with my license have to sign your marriage license. You've got to go through counseling. You can't get out for a year, and it's got to be for a felony. One person is a breadwinner. One person is a homemaker, not a housekeeper, a homemaker for a greater good. What's a greater good? Raising kids, building a business. Bonnie and Clyde did it for robbing banks. Bill and Hillary are doing it for being president. She helped him. Now he's going to help her. Hey, Louisiana, Arizona, Minnesota, and Michigan. These are covenant relationships. Okay? So, with that in mind, um, I want to show you the last part of this page. Now, you understand that this is rational. This is emotional. Look at what it is. Characteristics of an emotionally symbiotic relationship. Duty dating. Women give to please. Oh, he asked for it. He was so nice. So I said yes to him. As we know, men are into concrete and women are into abstract. So if she says yes any time without getting longevity, continuity, exclusivity, she's sold out. He now runs the relationship. And I hate to mention it, men don't run relationships for monogamous reasons. Men like diversification. So you're liable to be competing with your sister and everybody on the planet for your own husband. So a guy's got to surrender. Who's got to surrender first? The man, the yang. Okay, so here we go. How do people form relationships? Page nine. Here's a maternal-paternal symbiosis. This is a mom, she's 25, and this kid is three. Is that normal? Yeah. Now we got a mom, she's 35, and let's see, no, she's 45, and the kid is 22. Is that normal? That's dependent, that's codependency. So that can impact you. This is an 85-year-old mom with a 45-year-old kid. Is that normal? Of course it is. This is, a ten, this is a parent of 35 and a kid that's 10 years old taking care of a drunk. Is that normal? Symbiosis. These are two adult human beings, fraternal, sexual, or non-sexual, Let's hook it up. These people think they're in love. They've negotiated, they've made a deal. What happens if one of them is not committed? Now it's incompatible. Now we're in trouble. So you've got to know what's healthy and comfortable. And if it's not, women give to please and men seem to use and abuse, when the truth of the matter is, they're just getting gifts. And the breakdown is women get angry. Men are bad. 
and women and men get guilty. And that's the emotional symbiotic relationship. Everything can be good or bad, including relationships. Yes? What's the difference between I love you and I'm in love with you? Okay. I love you means you are my friend. You are my friend. Did you notice the, the arrows penetrate? Do you know what I require people to do when they have a bad love affair? Push the arrow through. There's less damage staying till the end than pulling the arrow out and tearing all the flesh with it. So when you're in love with somebody, they've penetrated your soul. There's a wonderful book by John Sanford, it's called The Invisible Partners. When a man is in love with a woman, she is the image of his soul. And he is the image of her soul, the animas. When a man and or a woman are, they love each other, they are dear friends. That's this one. But they're not in love. This is hooking up. This is what I teach. Does, do you understand that? Yes? What's the difference between having sex and making love? Well, having sex is a dopamine producer that basically allows you to have sex with your friend until the bitch gets mad and says, I've been used. How'd you get used? You see? Making love is you negotiate your deal. You negotiate your deal. You don't play games. These are games. Persecutor games, rescuer games, victim games. Games are when what you say, when what you say is not what you mean. Intention. You're out of integrity. When you are truly in integrity, Page three. When you're in integrity, take a look at the various ways that we structure time. Remember, we got to get strokes and we got to get time. Withdrawal. Look at all the people that do not care about stoicism. This is heaven. Get it all. Do you see that? Second level, rituals. It's Sunday we go to church and Saturday we go bowling. Past timing, we talk a good show and don't put it into operation. Activities work. I don't know why I'm playing bridge, I hate bridge. Games, persecutor games. Intimidating persecutor, seductive guilt, and not negotiation. Communication, look at communication. This is us. And this creates intimacy. You know what intimacy is to me? Intimacy is the ability to ask for what you want and negotiate it, and the ability to say no to what you don't want and mean it. That's intimacy. Do you see? So with that in mind, I want our darling couple to come up. OK. So I'm really grateful that you're willing to negotiate this. So. Uh, have you been dating? Where are you in this relationship? We've been dating for about nine months now. And uh, it's gone pretty well. Okay. Yeah. So that's where we're at. Nine All right. In. Have you had intercourse? Yes, we have. You've had intercourse. What was the agreement? What, what was your long range goals? Because you've been to my seminars, so you know longevity, continuity, and exclusivity. So, did you negotiate longevity, exclusivity, continuity? We did, actually, yes. Um, I didn't feel comfortable consummating and having intercourse until we talked about how often we'd see each other and 
um, long term, and we, we, he didn't want me dating anyone else. And okay, so you came to that point where it was time to negotiate either dropping out or moving forward. So you agree that you're aiming towards marriage, is that correct? Well, <clears throat> marriage or mating, so a long-term relationship, basically. What we've agreed so far is yes. the basics. Like, we agreed that we'd have a long-term relationship. All right. And that we'd be exclusive and that we would see each other regularly. So that's kind of, we've kind of built that far. Now okay. Yeah, but we didn't talk, we didn't agree whether or not we were going to be married. Right. So that's... Okay, so what's your comfort zone? I'm, I'm comfortable with marriage. I, I realized in processing my feelings that I do want to be a married woman. You don't want to mate. Correct. Okay. Ask him what he thinks about that. Is he, are you the man in the relationship? Are you the yang? I'm the yang. You want to be respected first, cherished second. Is that correct? Definitely. Now, do you want to be cherished first, respected second? Good. Okay, because that compliments. Then you can waltz. You can be Fred Astaire and you're Ginger Rogers. All right? Okay, so you basically don't want to legally marry, and you have come to the realization you do want to be married. Well, what are we going to do? What do you think about that? Well, that's what kind of we're in the negotiation phase because when we first started, we agreed we would be together long term, and you both agreed. Just, but we haven't gotten to, to this. Uh, we get well, married? you're here now, and here we are. <laughs> so, uh, is this a deal breaker? It's not a deal breaker for me because as I've come to know her and care about her, I'm moving more in that direction. I still want to wait a year before I make a decision if I want to get So how long have you dated? Nine months. Nine months. So we've got three months to go? Yeah. But okay. I'm, but I'm open to the concept of us getting married. Are you open to an engagement? You know, where she can wear a ring that says, I'm taken. Yes. I mean, right now, I mean, she did get a promise ring because... We okay, so she's that. got the so promise ring. Ask her if she's comfortable with just the promise ring with the big negotiation in three months. So now where we are right now, are you comfortable with the promise ring and where we are right now? Yes, right now. Right now. Okay, so are we doing pre-engagement counseling now? Yeah, I guess yes. we kind of are. That's right. <laughs> okay, well then let's get down to how you want to handle time. Now, do you have any processes? Do you go hunting? Do you do anything that that requires that you be without her for a period of time? Well, the one thing is I am a more of an introverted person. Yes. So I do tend to need time alone or want time alone. Yes. So that helps me. I mean, the things I do alone, maybe go hiking or... Uh, reading, just some time alone. I mean, I love being with her, obviously, but I do require some time alone. Okay, now, the problem with what you're saying is it comes into the category of uh, a uh, loser kind of communication. There's four signs of a loser in communication. Number one, they're evasive. I want some time. Anybody know what some time is? I don't know what that is. Secretive. If you loved me, you'd know. You would know. Love would help you know what I want without me asking for it. Then there's condescending, thinking you're bigger or littler. And then there's abrupt. Shut up, sit down, go away, whatever. So are you willing to tighten up? your evasive statement of some time alone. I want three afternoons a month. I want, I don't know what you want. Yeah, sure. What is it? Well, within that context to be specific. I yes, I want specific. The devil is in the details, right? Yes. I would say two days a week that I have time to myself. And that's 12 midnight to 12 midnight the next day. It doesn't have to be up for the whole 24 hours, but I guess... Well, then, really how many hours? I would say... Are you people understanding? Precision. Well, if I was going to look at it that way, I'd say... For no, the you day, are going to look at it that way. Well, I'm looking at it that way now. I'll say for the day, and I'm more than happy to see her at night. 
So from if no I day and night, okay, no so that doesn't work either. Eight in the morning. Well, no, eight in the morning till six at night. What do you so want to do from that? I have time to myself. I have to tell you what I'm going to do. How many day, How many days a week? Two. Two days a week. You want eight to eight to six. Ask her how she feels about how that. Okay, so do you have something with time? Well, I'm also an introvert, so that appeals to me. Um, alone time. Alone time. So his two days a week, eight to six or whatever it is. I like that. All right. So if you can't do the whole eight to six, are you willing to divide the time up to the hours and spread it out over different days? I'm willing to do that. Okay. I suggest that you let each other see a calendar or some kind of an event that lets them know that these are I time. There's I time and then you put your date life in there, we time, and you put your social life with other people in there. Do you see? Because by knowing what's going week to week, you know, every Sunday we'll put down our calendar. Okay? okay? Will you do that? Yes, sure. All right, so that's I time. And do you know about we time? Well, when that's just the two of you, no TVs, no beepers, no cell phones. Date nights. What? Date nights. Date nights? Okay. So, least, what is your pleasure? At least once a week. For once a week, a date? Yes. Okay. Just two people? Yes. Doing something sensuously pleasurable? Yes, or going to a restaurant. Um, holding hands. Yes. Good. Ask him what he thinks about that. What do you think about that? I think it's good. I think at least once a week, preferably for me, at least twice a week. Okay. Oh, that's, that's even better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're counter-offering two. Two. Yes. Ask her how she feels. How do you feel about that? Very good. All right. Like if you'll notice, you ask for what you want and ask her how she feels. You tell him what you feel, ask him what he thinks. That's the waltz. Okay? How much socializing do two introverts do? How often? Once a month? Twice a month? Well, we're both introverts, so it's not a, I don't know, for me it's not a big thing, but how about you? How do you feel about that? Well, I like to socialize with my girlfriends. But that's I time. No, we're talking about us time. Uh, once a month, minimum. Okay. We're, everything we're doing is minimum. Once a month. You can always do more, but you can't do less unless you renegotiate. Do you see? Negotiate a change, don't break a contract. Because the only way you know you love yourself is by the contracts, commitments you're willing to make and keep without being evasive, secretive, condescending, or abrupt. Because those are gamey. Okay? I like once a month. Like once a month socializing? That's right. Yeah, the, yeah, I agree with that. I okay. Think it's good for us to go out and be around other people. All right. Yeah, at least good. Before. So have we done time? Yeah. Okay. Now, I don't particularly approve I don't approve of people living together unless they're engaged. Well, we don't live together, by the way. Okay, that's what I'm saying, so you're fitting that. Are you good guests in each other's homes? Am I? Are we, yeah, are we, have we got the odd couple here, you know? No. Neat huh? Nick and Slob? Well, I'm a, definitely messier than she is, but, uh, but I do pretty good at her place. Okay, <laughs> ask her how she feels about that. Yes, you're right. Okay. All right. Good. So space is not, if it isn't in prob a problem area, do you see? We don't have to worry about it. Now, when you choose to live together, then you've got to negotiate private space, my closet, my drawers, uh, maintenance, who takes the cars into the fixer-upper, who goes to the grocery store, do you trade it, do you do whatever, are you... By the way, do you people want a convenient, a codependent, or a covenant relationship? Where are you aiming? 
Right now it's convenient. Yeah. Is that going to be okay? As long as I'm not the main breadwinner. Okay. So you're willing to share money and chores? Yes. Okay. Yeah, me too. Um, well, Eamon, I, I say we're aiming towards a covenant more. I mean, somewhat of a modified covenant because we both do work. Yes. Uh, and she, she, I think she wants to continue to work. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhat modified, but for the most part, I'd be the main breadwinner. Main breadwinner, okay. So that's what we're aiming That's for. just fine. The one challenge that, that I think we might have is with the living location. Oh, yes. We do live in different cities. So it's been fine for now because we see each other a couple times a week. But if we do move to the next level and we do want to be living together and married, we haven't gotten there yet, but we will have to negotiate. Who looks like they're going to be the breadwinner in a future covenant? The major bread, well, she probably always work, but I'll be the major breadwinner. You'll be the major. Yeah. So therefore, she would need to acquiesce to your career in order to support you making money. Remember, men mate and marry for sensual and sexual stability, homes and attractive sexual women. Women mate and marry for status and financial security. The book on that is The Evolution of Desire by David Buss. It's about that study, okay? So ask her if when you get down the road and you're ready to do a covenant relationship, how does she feel about giving up her job? Maybe not a job, she may get another job, but how would she feel acquiescing to living near your job? Um, if we get further down the road, when, when we get further down the road, how do you feel about changing location of where you live so it's closer to where I live or actually we'll be living together so it's closer to my work? so I can work on being the major breadwinner for us. I feel good about that. Okay, so she'll acquiesce. Acquiesce is a wonderful word. It means I'm going to do something I wouldn't do if I was single and independent for the sake of the team. It's not capitulate. It's not surrender. It's acquiesce. Excellent word. Do you see what I mean? Period. All right, so we've got that. What about money? What are your ideas about handling money? Is there going to be a comptroller, somebody that pays the bills? Somebody, are you going to put the money together? There's my money, your money, and our money. I believe in two accounts and a kitty. And while you're both working, do you put in dollar for dollar or percentage, depending on the person who brings in? If you bring in 50000 she then would be a 25,000, you know, it would be not necessarily equal, which is very convenient, but you don't have one. You have a modified covenant. You're going to make more, but. So at this time, uh, how do you see money being run through your relationship when you are living in the same place, whether you're engaged or married? You're asking me or her? I'm asking you. The way I see it is, I would basically pay all the bills. And you would write, you would pay them? Yes. So I basically pay all the bills with my money. I really don't want her money. So however she wants to spend her money, that's fine. So you're giving her the right to earn money and spend it on herself, which still benefits you because you're not paying for the things she's buying for herself. Exactly. For example, you might say, because being evasive, is not as good as, I want you to pay for your own clothes out of your money. Otherwise, she's just going to stash it away. Do you see? And you're not going to benefit in any way. That's a codependency. Right. Well, I, like I said, I want to pay the major bills. And if she pays for her coffee at Starbucks when she goes to work or whatever, she, she likes to buy a little thing. She has really nice accessories. Those kind of things. Okay. Whatever she wants to do with her money. All right. Uh, with me. Okay. So. How do you feel about that? Fabulous. Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, women do like that. Okay. And remember, what we're negotiating is basically for the next two months. Okay. Do you see? As much as you can do. And it may be opening an account. It may be, you see, you've already got a promise ring. You are going to do things based on this contract, but it's good for two months, then you upgrade. The first year, every two months for a year. 
The second year, whether you're married or not, is immaterial. The second year, it's every four months. The third year, every six months, which is twice. And then from then on, no less than once a year, anniversary process. The way to have a great marriage is to keep upgrading your contract. The same rules for business work for the business of being married or mated. People think that you can spontaneously create. No, spontaneity produces chaos. Discipline allows spontaneity. Okay? Now, we're down to play. Are you nice playmates on a non-sexual level? Are we? <laughs> so does that need, I'm going to give you a suggestion. I want you to go to the bookstore and get two journals, either leather bound or vinyl, right? In those journals, they're dream books, you put down small, medium, and large things you want to do, visit, receive, whatever, uh, dates, locations to visit, put them in there and put both books in the same drawer, someplace, your place, her place, and spy on them. And this will inspire date material, gift material, vacation material, sexual material, without having the talking of bleh. You see, I like talking, but wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody could look at a book tie a, a blindfold around your eyes, take you to the airport, and whisk you off to Vegas or someplace. Yeah, that's good. I really like that idea. Please you see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's a dream book, yeah, yeah. okay? Yeah. So, do you have any problem being non-sexual playmates? I don't know if I'm non-sexual playmates. Okay. You know, movies, yeah. dancing. We like to be together and do stuff together, so I think we're, we're pretty good there. Okay. Well, then we're going to get down to the hot subject before we end. Sexuality. Is there anything he does sexually that you don't like? Is he patting women on the butt at the party? What? Is there anything he's doing you don't like? No. I mean, he's a big flirt, but I know that's him not... Serious. Serious. Okay, right. some women take it serious, you don't. No. That's your personal prerogative. Is there anything she does? Is she kissing the guys on the cheek? Oh, you cute thing. Uh, I don't know, not around me. So All right. That's good. Okay. <laughs> um, not, nothing really stands out. I think, I think it's pretty good. We, we seem to respect each other and care about each okay. other. Okay. Notice, I don't feel so your trust record is building. Yeah, her, her track record has you know, been... Trustworthiness. Led me to believe, oh, she's not trustworthy. She I got her. it. She okay, the no betrayals are on foot. Yeah. Okay. Now, what is your personal desire for sexuality in any relationship? Well, I'm going to be very specific. Twice a week. You want, you want to make love? Make love twice a week. Now, remember, when you make okay, love... Minimum. Yeah, minimum. You can do whatever. Making love is mind, body, and spirit. Some days you might want to just have flaky sex. People who make love can have wonderful wild sex periodically. People who only want sex never make love. That's a biggie. Okay? How about you? I'm comfortable with minimum twice a week. Okay. Making love. Yes. Making love. That's good. And whatever's extra is extra. Good. Got it. Okay. Are you planning any swinging? You're in California. No. No. I'm not. No. Are you? Well, no. <laughs> no, we're is that not. Something you want? No. Actually, I really prefer a monogamous relationship. Okay. Just being with one person. Your nature is built for diversity, but if you override it, you're a disciplined man. Exactly. Isn't, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay? All right. So do you have any questions? You know, I just thought of something. Um, under the time 
Um, I, I like it when we go away on weekends. How many times? Um, a month? A year? Maybe what? once every three months to get away from For how family. long? Friday to Sunday? What? Friday to Sunday. Friday to Sunday. Who do you want to plan it? You, him, both? What? Um, we can trade off. I can, I can plan all of them, or if he wants to, that's fine. Okay, so we'll see what he thinks. What do you think about that? Well, I'm not a big traveler, uh, but once every three months, I think we can definitely do. And I think a trade-off will be good, because I want to plan things and do them for you, and I also want you to be happy and do things that you like. So I think if we trade off, and once minimum every three months, I think that would work. Okay. How do you feel about what you just did? I love it. I feel great. I feel okay. Better. Good. I feel more clear. Good. How do you think, what do you think about what you just did? I think we have more clarity in it. I think we're in a better place to move forward because we have some of these things already talked about. So I think it's clearer and I feel that... And remember, it's good for two months. It's not for life. It's two months. Okay. And if you have an issue that comes up in the middle, don't break the agreement. Ask for a meeting and renegotiate. Will you do that? Yes. Good. Okay, thank you very much. Give them a round.